instead of doing SSR today, we're going to be listening to a senior extended essay. Um, it's sort of the same thing, concentration for the purpose of learning. Uh, I want to open the presentation by welcoming everyone who's here, and then I want to advocate for the responsible use of technology during the presentation. Um, if you're using technology for an appropriate purpose, great. If you have a cell phone with you, please make sure it's on silent so that it does ring, it doesn't interrupt the presenter. I also want to encourage everyone in the audience, especially the juniors who are in my SAT class, to ask questions during the question and answer session that follows. This is an important part of the SEE tradition. It allows um, the presenters to go to depth uh, with the research that they've done and really shows how how well they understand the connections between the ideas that they've researched. So we appreciate your participation in that conversation. This year we're videotaping the presentation so the students can use that in the final revision process. Final drafts are due Monday at 2.45. If you're a senior, please remember that. Also, there are two reviews and a self-reflection that are due. The two reviews are due on by the end of the day on Friday, and the self-reflection is due 48 hours from within the time that you present. So I want to give those uh, two reminders. Questions? A question? Okay. <laughs> I'm happy to answer your question. It's easier for me to do it in front of the group because then more people here. Do you have a question? Do you grant extensions? Do I grant extensions on the final draft, do you mean? No. no. On, the on the reflections? You'll have plenty of time in class on Tuesday and Wednesday to take care of those. Let me just put it back. Um, so, um, I want to think if there's anything else that I wanted to make sure to mention. I think if we're all uh, squared away. The one thing I'm a little concerned about is I have student work that I'm returning here and seniors haven't been picking it up. So if you know someone who's already presented, their score sheet is here and they can get it from me the day after they present and I'd ask you to encourage each other to pick those papers up so you can look through the feedback that you received. Any questions about that? Okay, thanks for giving me the space to do that post. So, um, I should just say that I feel like I should confess something about the student who's standing up here today. I don't know what it is, but I have this incredible ability not to physically see this person. Like, I have marked him absent in my class more times than any other student in the school. You guys know I don't mark people absent very often, but I mark him absent all the time, even when he's there. So it's like he has this invisibility cloak that he wears. But, <laughs> To, to back up from this, I do want to say that I feel like this is because of the grace and maturity that this young man um, exhibits on a daily basis, and it gives me very great pleasure to introduce you. Football and its basis is a simple game. It is the scoring of a spherical ball into the opponent's school. It is, it is said that there needs to be a ball, two goals, and a football pitch. However, in reality, only a ball is necessary. Football players are able to play wherever they want. I remember when I used to play on my parking lot when I was about 10 years old. My friends and I would put a shoe on the ground for each goalpost and play barefooted. Because of its simplicity, soccer has expanded vastly throughout the world. There are 300 million football players from over 200 different countries. This has brought a new factor into the game, flair. Players like Diego Maradona, David Beckham, Cristiano Ronaldo, and Lionel Messi have impacted world soccer and have made it a beautiful game. Hello, my name is Carlos Christian. This term, I researched the corruption in the FIFA Federation. The title of my essay is The Beautiful Tipping Point, How Football Lost Its Beauty and Became Corrupt. To start off, I would like to explain how the FIFA Federation works and what, and what it is. FIFA is the governing body of world football. Their primary objective is to improve the game of football constantly and promote it globally in the light of its unifying educational, cultural, and humanitarian values, particularly through youth 
and development programs. I will now show a short video on how FIFA works. I hope you enjoy it. And FIFA, as the guardians of the global game, it is our duty to serve the world of football and to ensure a healthy future for the game. As an association of associations, we understand that the decisions we make affect lives all over the world. 209 member associations, 300 million players in a global football community of 1.2 billion people. Global football is organized into six confederations spanning the globe. In South America, we have CONMEBOL. In North, Central America and the Caribbean, we have CONCACAF. In Europe, there is UEFA. In Asia, it's the AFC. In Africa, the CAF oversees the game. And in Oceania, the OFC is the regional voice. These six confederations represent and serve the needs of their national associations. To ensure we're all making the right decisions for the game, we need to get the right people together at the right times, so that no one person or nation has too much influence. The FIFA Congress meets every year to take the big decisions for the game. All of our 209 member associations are represented and each has one vote in our democratic system. Decisions are taken by locally elected representatives from around the world. How to apply FIFA statutes, who should host the World Cup, which new associations are accepted to FIFA, where and how our budget is spent, how we learn and how we improve the way we work. Our members select the FIFA Executive Committee with 23 elected members from our six confederations alongside the FIFA president and three female representatives. In this executive body of the global game, the many voices of the world of football come together. FIFA's many committees work hard to serve the needs of the global football community and the game. Based in Zurich, the FIFA General Secretariat with 400 employees from more than 40 different countries, serves the needs of our members. We organize a full range of international competitions. We run football development programs across the world. We carefully manage the finances and legal issues. We preserve and protect football. And we do all this in a transparent, accountable and efficient way, so that everyone can see how and why decisions are made how our revenues are raised and spent, and so that we can give as much back to the world of football as possible. From grassroots to the heights of international football, this open and democratic structure gives the global game the foundation it needs to grow and thrive. I based my presentation off of a book by Malcolm Gladwell called The Tipping Point, How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference. I decided to do this because I believe today football is a global game. Because I believe that in the world of football there is one moment when corruption started. This was on June 22, 1986, in a World Cup match between England and Argentina. Diego Maradona became a legend as he sprinted past six English defenders and scored the goal of the century with his hand. As many of you may know, a soccer player can't use his hands. However, Maradona's goal went on in history as the hand of God. It is worshipped, it remains unpunished, and his image was untarnished. Many forms of corruption have appeared after this one. On January 27, 1994, the Caribbean Cup qualifications were being played. Puerto Rico, Granada, and Barbados were fighting to qualify. 
Puerto Rico had beaten Barbados 1 to 0. Puerto Rico had also lost 2 0 against Granada. In order for Barbados, for Barbados to go through, they had to win by a 2 0 lead against Granada. For this tournament, there was a golden goal rule. If you would, if you would go to extra time, there was the golden goal rule. If you scored a goal, the game would, would be over. The first team to score a goal would win the match, and this goal would count as two. As the game started, Barbados started winning two to zero. However, with a few minutes left, Granada scored one goal. The lead was only by one. So the Barbados team started to plan to score an own goal on themselves in order to tie the game and go into extra time and hopefully win the, win the golden goal. Barbados was successful in this and scored the goal and went on and won 4-2 to two against Granada. It created a lot of confusion and even the Grenadian defense started scoring on themselves and the Barbados attack defended the Grenadian on her article published on Quartz Magazine, Soon Ha Kim reports that in the 2002 World Cup quarterfinals, an Egyptian referee, Gamal Gandur, disallowed two legitimate goals by Spain against Korea. As some of you may know, the 2002 World Cup was held in Korea. One goal was disallowed for a phantom foul and the other because the ball was called out of bounds on a cross, even though the ball was at least one ball in bounds, one ball length in bounds. According to BBC, it was reported that Gandur had received a Hyundai car from then Korea FIFA Vice President Chung Mong Jun. On 2015, investigations by American law found out that FIFA officials were receiving bribes from companies and countries. The chaos revolves around two very important people. FIFA president, Sepp Blatter, who claimed that corruption needs to be stopped now in order to prevent FIFA's reputation to be dragged through the mud. And Conmebol president, Nicolás Leos. According to the New York Times, Nicolás Leos allegedly received bribes over two decades in exchange for awarding companies the marketing and media rights to Copa America. Lastly, the American FBI started to research on the decision to host the World Cup of 2022. This World Cup had been decided to be either in Qatar or in the United States, and Qatar was chosen. Because of this, the US decided to put the FBI to hold an investigation as to why. According to the Sunday Times of London, they found out that a Qatari official had paid millions of dollars to voters and influencers in exchange for World Cup votes. There are four major groups which are being corrupt. FIFA officials who are accepting bribes from countries and companies. Referees who are taking bribes in order to set up games. The players themselves who are accepting bribes in order to reduce their performance and then the teams themselves were accepting rights in order to fix matches. According to Snoops, Dan Tan, the world's most famous alleged match fixer, is suspected of the manipulation of hundreds of matches and is said to have paid bribes up to $135,000 to players and officials. The solution. Currently, there are investigations being held and people being indicted. The BBC News states that on May, the US indicted 14 current and former FIFA officials. I believe that this is not enough. This is only the first step. The first step is to get rid of the corrupt members of the FIFA Federation. The second step is to reorganize how the Federation works. On his article in Sports Illustrated, Grant Wall explains that the FIFA Executive <coughs> Committee should be turned into a, bottle, into a body modeled more closely on the United Nations Security Council. Any country that has won a men's or women's World Cup becomes a permanent member. 
10 additional members would be chosen from countries other than the World Cup winners on a two-year basis. The new committee could veto the decision with a two-thirds majority. Also, minimum of five women have to make the committee. Wall also states my third step. The Federation should repeal the bylaw installed two years ago that requires a FIFA presidential candidate to have spent at least two of the five years active, two of the last five years active in soccer. This is removing true outsiders who could be worthy candidates. In conclusion, I believe that the FIFA Federation must renovate the essence of international football by removing the guilty, changing its ways, and expanding its work, workforce. These small solutions can make a big difference. As stated by Malcolm Gladwell on the tipping point, look at the world around you. It may seem like an immovable, implacable place. It is not. With the slightest push in just the right place, it can be too. Because the ref had called it a goal, it was still counted as a goal. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So then later in your presentation, you said that the committee could veto decisions. Are you saying that the committee would be able to veto ref's decisions? No. The decisions, they, like the, the decisions I'm referring to are the decisions made by other committees. Like, you have your Congress, which is still going to stay there. Okay. And if they make a decision, let's say, on beach soccer, that the, the upper council can repeal that decision with a two-thirds majority. Okay, so you're talking about the rules and regulations yeah. of the game. Like and not, it's just like yeah. where the competition is going to be held uh -huh. like that. But the rest would still be the dominant guy on the field. Yeah, like in that case, you can't just... Like in NBA, in NFL, you have a like your coach can can challenge a play, mm -hmm. 
uh, and by challenging the play, they repeat and watch it on video. But I think that in soccer, I, I don't think that's like the best solution. I think that we have uh, two linemen in each side, mm -hmm. and you should be, you have three referees on one on one side, the other one in the center of the field, mm -hmm. and then uh, the other one on the other side, and you have two, one on each goal. Uh, and then I think that's enough so that people can see it's just corruption. So the linesmen and the referees have always been sort of a part of the game, yeah. the tradition of yeah. the game at a professional level, and you're not you're not advocating that we replace them with technology or no. that the committee be able to override their decisions, but that the committee be able to repeal decisions that are made by subcommittees around oh. rules and regulations. Okay. Are there other questions? Okay. Uh, I think I think so because uh, Qatar. I believe that Qatar is not in the necessary conditions in order to host the World Cup. For example, in my research, I found out that Qatar's average temperature in about mid July is about 106 degrees Fahrenheit. So you don't have the necessary conditions for temperature for the for the soccer players to play fit in. And then also, Qatar does not have the necessary infrastructure in order to play. They're planning to build the stadium with air conditioning and that can be movable and everything. So that's a lot, a lot of money being spent unwisely. And I think there are better options, like in this case, the United States, who would have been a better option to host the World Cup instead of Qatar. It's my question. Just, uh, in those slightly relative pictures that raise and the feet on the bottom, is the one in the blue, uh, that one, is that like old? Or is that, <laughs> <laughs> is that an old look? That's a fast It's the same. It's just this one that's colored. Exactly. Which is. Any more questions? I have lots of questions, but I'll ask them to you. 